Uh, I think we, we should start, okay, uh, because uh, the, the time is limited and I don't want to also cross the, the time. So welcome everybody for the training. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, the international safety goals, which is a, a major fundamental uh, concept in any healthcare setting uh, in any uh, organization. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the concept of uh, international safety goals should be uh, understood and known by all the employees of the, uh, the company. So that's why we, we said that uh, all the nurses and doctors and also managers and supervisors, managers and supervisors, they have to also transfer this uh, to the uh, their subordinates or their employees. Uh, so, uh, inshallah, today we'll start with a, a presentation with Hassan about international safety goal. And again, I'm gonna uh, ask you, if you have any question, please raise your hand and ask. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the concept of an international safety goal because already we are we are hanging this in all the walls in in al farabi so uh, inshallah it's going to be a, a quick and uh, smooth uh, training uh, good luck Good morning. Hi everybody, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Sam, for introducing me. Uh, I hope yesterday it was a very and productive day and you get an idea about our yesterday subject, which is uh, hand hygiene fiction control costs. Right. Today we are going to speak, is my sound clear, I think? Yeah, today we are going to speak about uh, international patient safety goal. Yeah, where it is a very uh, clear for everyone what it does stand for, International Based Safety Goal, ISPG. Type. Uh, number one uh, is what does a uh, goal, uh, International Safety Goal, stand for? We have uh, around seven international safety goal that the patient fall, and we have also the Hand hygiene, which stands for minimize healthcare acquired infection. 
<coughs> Additionally to this, we have also the uh, ID, patient identification. More or less, we have medication uh, safety in terms of high alert. How you need to assure that you are high, high alert medication being checked very well before you inject it. Uh, one of uh, ultimate important uh, ISPG is the effective communication. Here we are talking about verbal order, telephone order, verbal communication, and so on. <clears throat> now, uh, if we think about patient safety goal, it, it's not today's story. It's in fact, it is uh, a reflection of uh, the statistical data where it used to be accumulated within the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission in its first edition, they standardized some of uh, Sentinel events, like they make categorization where most common error that we are receiving from our accredited hospital. And they found out of this, there are seven uh, common scenarios, more or less they are the first any common factors participate uh, for uh, patient death or sentinel event. And those scenarios are where we are talking about patient safety goal of uh, identify your patient correctly, identify the surgical site, minimize healthcare associated infection and so on. So if we move toward of uh, a culture that the safety are really oriented within our Farabi center or within our or a healthcare organization, we will be notified that we are talking about the international patient safety goal. If we want to minimize any expected error as a proactive system, we are going to talk about more effective communication among the staff that scroll out all uh, verbal communication. If we want to assure our equipment and process are standardized, we are talking about ISPG, promote effective communication, the staffing, team training, and more or less also patient involvement that take a major part in our ISBG implementation. So let us talk about the first one, which is a very common one. And nowadays, nobody can step in any healthcare facility without proper identification. Is the first one is how to identify your patient correctly. And as you remember, we agree in our policy that you will identify your patient by having the full name, you have the full name of the patient. Also, you will have the medical record number. So this is our two identifier, full name and patient medical record number. And already this is stated in our policy and we should from now and then, whenever we want to proceed a procedure to give a blood, to give medication, to ask for diagnostic uh, lab investigation or X-ray, always identify your patient correctly. And please, please remember this. Identify your patient correctly, one of the core standard. What does it mean core standard in Sibahi? It means one standard stand for all. If you don't have the right process of patient identification, the survey will not last longer and it will be denied. And always remember that you ever never use patient room or bedroom. Now you will say, okay, we are outpatient facility. We don't have a patient room, but you still have a clinic. And as we know that the clinic, they have number. So please don't use the clinic number or bed or stretcher patient room. Here there's some of uh, يعني, nominated ways that we, we would like to have it uh, everywhere whenever we are talking about patient ID identification, which is known to everybody, the hand bracelet. Now, in our facility, we rely on the invoice. It could be used since it has the two identifier, but always ask the patient, could you please tell me what's your name? This is a better way and more safe way rather than saying, are you Muhammad Ali? Are you Mr. Hassan? Are you Sami Farabi? No, this is not convenient. Always ask the patient, could you tell me your good name? In this way, you will have a full assurance that he spelled his name correctly and you hear it very well. What about medical record? Just compare the medical record between the ID band bracelet with the screen or with the patient file. Now your file is electronic file. So compare the ID number from the electronic file with the invoice. 
please, please remember this. This is a very serious issue. As I said, a one school standard stand for all. So if you have a very good 100% compliance of intervention safety goal, but for some reason, you don't apply the approval identification. You, you fail. That's it. That's it. Now, in case you will have semi-conscious patient or unconscious patient, always remember they are having the right identification. Yes, it might be have less frequent uh, within your facility as outpatient uh, facility, but it could happen. So always ask the, uh, the relative or for those semi-conscious patient uh, with their parents or with their company, Let's say, ask them what the patient name, what is the document, can I see his passport, his etama? You need to do the double check and assure the patient full name and the model number. Also, if you have an unknown or unknown patient, for example, some of the facility, they could face this scenario, like a patient to drop from road traffic accident or traumatized patient. They are, look, by any means, they come to you seeking health care. What are you going to do? Okay, they are not, they are unconscious. They are, you would say unknown, unknown patient identification. So what the way we should do this, I, I, this is something we really need to think about it. If you have unknown patient identification, uh, remember his first word will be no, signify for the first name, and the second word will be name signified, oh. signified for his second name. Excuse me, sir, Sorry. Yeah. If your voice is not clear now, we cannot hear you. Okay. Now, now it's okay. My sound. Yes. Do yeah. you think now it's better? Okay, better. So, if you face unknown patient identification, please remember that he still need to be identified by having the first word like first name is no. The second name will be, uh, the second word will be name. So is the second name, uh, this is like, this is the first name, this is the second name. Now, the serial number will be given by the admission office. They can create the electric and medical file number for him. This is a very seldom occasion. I hope it will not happen, but in case if it happened, just keep in mind. Now, um, how to do the right way of identification? As we said earlier, you need to compare the ID band or the bracelet on the patient with the rightful name and medical record number. Now, you don't have this mechanism of ID bracelet. So what I will do, I will do a comparison between electronic file with the invoice. Especially remember those four cases, patient are going for blood investigation, lab test, phlebotomy. Second scenario, if patient have any X-ray, you should identify your patient. The third scenario, if patient going to receive any medication, injection or tablet or whatever in your facility. And finally, if the patient going to have any blood or blood transfusion. So always remember medication, lab investigation, x-ray, uh, those things, uh, always you are doing the right uh, identification. <clears throat> Even in UNIT, they still need to be identified, you know, especially pediatric and infant. We will use the same way, but again, you might not face this uh, scenarios. You might not have infant or babies, but just for your information here and for the baby, the, the ID band on the bracelet uh, of the baby will be applied not in just one location. We could apply it for four locations or three locations, and it will be the mother free name and the medical record number if he's a newborn. <clears throat> Uh, as we said, the ID bracelet will be in the ankle and uh, also we, we could put it in the incubator. Uh, remember always as outpatient clinic, uh, uh, if you could have artificial kidney unit, day case, oncology, you still need to identify your patient whenever you are uh, giving him a mild sedation or any type of contest. Type. Let us go to the, remember also, if you are going to do procedure, yes, we don't have one day, we say one day surgery procedure, but also keep in mind if you're going to do procedure, like IV line insertion, central line, also you need to identify your patient correctly. 
whenever you are approaching your patient to be served, remember to identify your patient correctly. Now we're going to move to the second goal. This is, uh, for me, is the most significant goal. How to have effective communication and why we need to have effective communication. Effective communication, as you remember yesterday when we, we explained the, the, the lecture of OVR, occurrence variance report, we noticed that one of the root cause analysis for many sentinel event or, or error is the communication. You know, some of us, they are thinking communication is, is a subject. In fact, it's a very complex subject. You, you might have many conflict generated out of any proverb or uh, you know, unrationalized uh, or uh, you know, let's say the block channel of communication. So what we are concerning here, we are concerning about verbal telephone order, when you will accept it. Remember always, you will never accept verbal order unless it's emergency. And when we say emergency, that mean, that mean is uh, life situation saving. You know, you have life situation saving. So this is the only way or the only exception to receive or to believe in verbal order. A good example here is code blue. Now, effective communication also can be stand for a good example of other scenarios, like you are taking a lab result or panic result. Whenever you take a lab result or panic, panic result means critical result, like the result out of normal range, also it required immediate intervention. This is what we mean by panic or critical result, because sometimes you could have a reading of out of normal range, but it couldn't be considered as panic because it doesn't followed by uh, intervention or instant intervention. So whenever you have critical result that has to have, to have immediate intervention, it means panic result. So whenever you have those panic results, always remember to write it down and read it back and take the name of the sender or the one you're talking about. Like, okay, this is the lab. Can you give me your name? Uh, this is Mr. Hassan. I'm the lab technician. I'm going to give you the potassium result of your patient uh, to identify full name, medical record. Uh, it was seven or oh, six, potassium is six, potassium serum is six. This is need to be notified directly after you write it down and read it back again to the a lab technician and assure you you document the right information. The, why panic result and uh, any critical communication, it, it really matters because the, sim the, the easiest way to escape from our responsibilities, either as a nurses or as a doctors, I would say I've been not informed. I've been not informed. This is the easy way to escape from your responsibility or from your clinical rule. And there's a very easy answer to be said, especially if he being notified either by any means of a verbal, non-documented or not uh, any, uh, written uh, communication. That's why if you notice here, whenever you have a verbal order from any physician and remember the verbal order will never be accepted unless it's emergency. Emergency between two brackets, life-saving. Life-saving is the only thing means emergency. If not life-saving, doctor, please come and write it down on the system. Enter it down by your username and password and make it on the system. So remember, if you receive a verbal order and during emergency or a CBR or resuscitation, that the physician are not leaving unless he countersign this order within 24 hours. Again, panic laboratory result and X-ray result. Panic doesn't mean only lab. I could have uh, some of my diagnostic uh, studies for X-ray department show patient has, for example, uh, erotic aneurysm, or he has pulmonary embolism, uh, pulmonary embolism, or he has brain hemorrhage. All these diagnostic studies, either by brain CT scan or by X-ray, you need to notify immediately the prescriber or the treating doctor because it required an immediate intervention. This is what the mean the, the, the panic result should, should have those consequences. 
Okay. Now, let us go to more example of uh, how the nurse she will receive the order, how the nurse she will receive the order, and what the consequences. Before or after, remember, if you are a nurse or if you are a resident doctor, you are not the treating doctor, you are not the main consultant, all your rule is stand on the chain of command. What meaning of chain of command? That you are raising the message to the right person in the proper channel. Uh, for example, if the head nurse receive an order from, oh, sorry, receive a result from lab technician that you have hemoglobin four or three for your patient, then this head nurse should notify the charge nurse. The charge nurse should follow the order to the emergency department uh, care manager or let's say supervisor. Then the supervisor will notify directly the treating doctor. Never uh, yeah, minimize or compromise this issue, these issues. <clears throat> you have more example about that if I notify someone, okay, and within five minute interval, he did not respond to me, shall I wait? No way, you don't need to wait. Directly follow, follow the, the upper hand. Let's say if I inform the resident, but the resident did not respond to my order or to my notification either, patient critical condition, patient lab result, patient X-ray result. What I should do? Directly jump to the specialist. Okay, there is no specialist. Shall I wait? More than five minutes, go ahead for the consultant. So always, always assure you are following the chain of command and you are doing things in the proper channel of communication. And whenever you have any order, verbal or a result, this result or this verbal order or this verbal communication should be documented and should be authenticated. We agree with the, the, your managers and leadership. If you are not a paper system where the stamp and the signature can be afforded, then we will rely on username and password as authentication way for any receiving or, or sending uh, any order or report. Medication cannot be administered by verbal or telephone order, especially high alert medication. This is very important. Sometimes the physician are stand to you and it's not emergency and by any means you accept his verbal order. Why? Believe me, the first or the last person always will be blamed, the one who accepts things out of its official way. You have a system that electronic, you can enter the order in the system, the order will be dispensed from the pharmacy, then you can carry it over. Please protect yourself at the same time, protect your patient. High alert medication, this is goal number three. Uh, just to summarize high alert medication, why do you put it in a, in a separate goal? They could merge it under the effective communication. Just for one point that they find the, most of the error if I want to have a statistical way of how much error I could have, you will find that many, many error that done and still occurring on a daily basis is medication error, either underdose or overdose. So that's why they make the high alert as a separate goal uh, as ISPG3. So what the meaning of high alert and what the high alert medication stand for? High alert, my definition for it, whatever medication, whatever medication by any route, IV, by oral, IM, you give it. But once you realize, once you realize your mistake, you find yourself, you give the wrong way. So in this scenario, what I should do? I should do double check before I give the high alert medication. By double check, you protect yourself and you assure your patient safety. So what the high alert medication, I said any medication you give and once you realize your mistake, you find your patient either pass away or you affect a very harmful to him. Anything doesn't stand on this criteria, then it's not a high alert medication. Once the damage are reversible, once the morbidity are reversible, I will not consider it high alert. 
So find here that uh, يعني concentrated electrolytes. Definitely, if you give any of those drugs, potassium chloride, sodium chloride, IV push instead to be by infusion, you are here causing uh, يعني a direct bradycardia and it could lead for cardiac arrest. Anything out of iron anotropes that you, you downgrade the dose or you upgrade the dose, it can lead for a major harm or death. So whatever major harm and death that you can be caused by a mistaken of the dose or, or the route of the medication, I will say it is a high alert medication. Anticoagulant, heparin, warfarin, Especially the unfractional heparin, that the 25,000 international unit is a good example of high alert. Uh, Inxobrain or delta parine, sorry, delta parine or other low molecular weight heparin. You know, all these are considered high alert medication. Also, neuromuscular blocking agent like trachorium, pancorium, brocoronium, propofol. Those are very sensitive drugs that whenever you inject it to the patient, it lead for complete relax of intercostal muscles, which will affect directly his respiratory rate and he might develop respiratory arrest. Also some um, cardiac arrhythmia drug like amidaron, digoxin. I had the scenario with the digoxin because I remember this incident very well. One of the pediatric cases during my days in King Faisal Special Hospital and the Safe Center uh, the doctor uh, wrote an order in a paper system that time that uh, digoxin, okay, digitalis, IV, 0.25 milligram. He did not put the O. He did not use the decimal point. He just put dot. Then he wrote 25. When the nurse she came to inject the drug, she read it as a 25 milligram IV instead of 0.25 milligram. And that, that day was really terrible anyway. The patient passed away and both of the physician and the nurse went for further investigation and discipline. So please take it seriously that whenever you use a written order, you don't use any prohibited uh, abbreviation, which could stand a good example of a uh, effective communication or not. So this is some sort of uh, yeah, a common high alert. And remember, all this high alert medication could be stored. Where, where the store of it? <coughs> the storage of the high alert, always the crash cart. And mainly our high alert medication will be in the crash cart. So please remember very well that you are putting a label. <coughs> the majority of us, they are thinking if I bought a label on the box, or the same uh, carton of the medication, the outside envelope, it's enough. No, they don't accept this. Sibahi, GCI, CMC, they don't accept this. They want you to put in every single envelope a sticker of high alert. High alert sticker is a very simple sticker that just uh, in red in color and show that you have uh, notified this is a high alert medication where my cosign or my counter sign should be done to, yani, with my colleague. I will not let the drug on my solo responsibility. <clears throat> okay. As well as we have what they call sound like look alike. Now, sound like look alike as a process from recruitment till you are monitoring the adverse effect of the drug on patient you need to distinguish it from the rest of medication by just simply double check, double check when you prescribe, double check when you dispense, double check when you inject. Now, who is responsible for any medication error? First of all, lack of continuous checking and double checking is the main, main responsibility of the charge nurse. You know, that always we need always keep in mind, check every shift, check every daily uh, area, medication are labeled, not labeled, who's coming. You know, always keep checking your medication for the label, uh, against the label for high alert and LASA, or what they call it, sound alike, look alike medication. And always check your crush card. Are the all medication in the crush card valid for use and labeled? Okay, we said whenever you are inject, you give, you prescribe, it should be 
يعني دبل تشيك with the nurses. Now we'll go for ISPG4, eliminate wrong site or wrong patient or wrong procedure. Uh, I think we, we don't have this in our Farabi group because we, are, we don't have the one day surgery and uh, also we are not a hospital. So this uh, standard will not be applicable in our facility. Please remember this. Identify surgical site or تحديد مكان العملية will not be applicable in our center. So I just will يعني, speak quickly about it. Uh, whenever you have any site for procedure, you should mark it. There is a special skin marker that used in the skin. And we're not supposed to give this uh, rule for assistant uh, resident or GB doctor. It should be either the consultant surgeon or his assistant. Uh, more or less anyone inside the theater that he will be in the theater, the theater during the surgery. Uh, nurse has no role in surgical site marking. The best way of doing this by what you call a surgical safety checklist or I call it timeout process, like whenever patient reach the holding area in the OR, we should do double check. Patient reach the recovery, I should do double check by right identification and so and so. Um, okay, let us, uh, we will see in the short video after this, I have short video, show you how the interpatient safety goals are translated into a real practice. So the IBCG4 is wrong site, we were done with it. Let us go now to ISBG5. Yeah. Five is how to have less nosocomial infection or what they call it, healthcare associated infection. Yesterday we had a very wide speak about this subject and we all emphasizing about uh, keep wash your hand, remind me you wash your hand, stop me to wash my hand in the right place. Five, reduce the risk of healthcare acquired infection. Again, hand hygiene, hand washing. When I, whenever, um, in, uh, يعني, whenever you are in contact with your patient, the you, you get out of the patient, or يعني, متى انت تواصلت مع مريضك, you are approaching your patient, remember just before and after, you are washing your hand. As simple. Wallahi, very simple thing, but very effective. Very effective. That's why we said yesterday, before patient contact, before aseptic technique, <clears throat> after body fluid exposure, after patient contact, after contact with patient surrounding, wash your hand after removal of the gloves as well. Responsibility, this is every single one responsibility, especially nurses and doctors, physician before nurses, because in my, in my records, I found many, Nurses, they're complying high, any higher or let's say better than physician. And unfortunately, if we have a compliance of nurses up to 60, maybe physician, they could have it 50 or 45. So please assure you are washing your hand before and after whenever you are approaching your patient or his surrounding. <laughs> you need also to educate patient and his relative. Uh, please wash your hand. Now, health-associated infection, you never you know, minimize it. It really works uh, very uh, you know, serious matter. Uh, I did not, you know, I seen and I witnessed some of patients, they came ambulated, they are walking, uh, they came for certain lab investigation or whatever, but by missing uh, the, the way of uh, proper hand hygiene and uh, standard precaution, they becomes as inpatient in our facility. Uh, finally, fall. Um, many of us think fall will never happen. In fact, fall every day happens. <laughs> yeah, and one of the day, uh, a patient fall in uh, a hospital where in the stairway, but nobody notify Nobody noticed. At the same time, patient was alone, uh, and he lie on the ground. And I think everybody will think this is impossible. 
and really the patient is was not that much يعني, old or uh, sedentary his يعني, age most likely young in 30s but she has some of uh, Alzheimer or delirium disorders so don't think patient will not fall patient will fall but what to happen in we are not reporting fall we are not considering slippering on the ground fall fall is happening and you should take our rule here our rule here is to remember which patient could have a higher risk for fall. That's why we will use what we call it uh, Morris scale for fall. This is Morris scale for fall. Did you hear it before? I think all of you heard this scale. Already we have a policy for this. Also we give the scale and we format it in your organizational form. So please, Remember to fill the Morris scale for, for adults. Uh, at least uh, يعني one time per visit within the same month. At least one time within a visit, okay? One visit within the same month. Like I'm your patient, I might come every three days, every five days, but assure that he has a one uh, Morris fall risk scale filled within 30 days or within his last uh, one month. This scale, to simplify it, is, is telling you who could fall in the future or who could fall while you are treating him. That's why it talks about the risk of falling. Like 45 is the highest risk. You should take your precaution. What is my precaution for a fall? Also, we have the scale of pediatric. Also, pediatric, they might fall, and we use for them Humpty Dumpty uh, for risk scale. <clears throat> Simply to reduce the risk of fall, you should first do the scale. If patient has a 45 or above risk of fall, then you need to be more aware and more caution by applying um, further uh, intervention. What the uh, intervention? I could apply uh, like IV band for risk band. I could put in the stretcher where he lying like a fall uh, risk sign. I could keep him in my nursing station, like in front of nursing station. I don't put him any yani, far away from my inside. This is some of the fault sign we could use for a patient. Also, this is for the pediatric. In case the patient fall, what I should do? You will take it as an OVR. You will fill all the, the points from A to Z, as yesterday we spoke about OVR system. Don't let it go, because this patient might come later in your facility and say, uh, guys, I fall in your hospital and you should now tolerate my cost of treatment and uh, the police uh, yani statement. They could offend you in this way. That's why you don't leave any patient fall from your unit unless you are sure you did the proper management from stabilization, treatment, and investigation. This is some of the interventions we talked earlier, what I will do in case my patient has a high fall percentage. You can see in the red color that, for example, uh, you don't have admitted cases, but let's say if I have low risk intervention, it will be in the yellow color. If I have medium risk, it will be in the green. The most uh, serious one is the red, which is 45 and above. Remember this number. 45 on Morris scale means patient has high fall of uh, risk. And he has high risk of fall. So that's why if you notice, all things are yes, yes, you should do, you should do. Like, for example, you should raise the side rail. You should keep call bill close to him. You should uh, go with his company to the toilet. So everything you should do, you should do. While other cases have more BRN, BRN means up and patient need or up and patient request. This is more interventional guide for for risk prevention. Used this form to manage pediatric cases. So this is for Humpty Dumpty, the pediatric. The first one was for the adult patient. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We're done with the lecture. And now I will uh, ask you please to pay full attention this is a very enjoying uh, video. This is a very enjoying video uh, for uh, summarizing the point of international patient safety goal. 
يعني ان شاء الله احنا ويضان هلا رح تشوفوا فيديو الفيديو هذا ان شاء الله حيعطيك فكره واضحه جدا وجميل جدا صراحه عملناه زمان في مستشفى المانع بلخص لك كيف انت ممكن تحط الاهداف السلام العامه او اهداف البيشنت سيفتي اللي حكيناها اللي هم السبعه في اطار توظيفي يعني انا اوكي انت حكيت لي ايدنتيفاي يور بيشنت كوريكتلي كيف راح اشتغل فيها حنشوف هلا بالفيديو كيف حيشتغل عليه موضوع السيرجيكال سايت ماركينج كيف راح نشتغل عليه فهلا حنعطيكم على الاستاذ سامي عشان يشبكنا على الفيديو يعطيكم العافيه يعطيكم العافيه جميعا And if you have any question, uh, please uh, just write it down, and after the video, you can ask it. Excuse me, we'll give, just give us uh, five minutes just to uh, uh, see uh, how, how we can uh, fix the problem of the video. Sorry. ما بعرف ما بعت لي شو بعت لي Thank you. 
Uh, the video is, uh, you can see the video on the screen. You can see the video? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. And the sound? Yeah, no, Sammy, stop. the video. Yeah, the video. Okay. صوت ما في صوت للكمبيوتر للفيديو صح؟ 
لا ما في صوت لا
then she goes and positive for other known history. Then a uh, consent for surgery, sign by patient, last September 11, 2013. Consent for anesthesia, also signed by patient, signed September 11, 2013. The anesthesia evaluation, can be Dr. Jabbar, if I saw already. Then, uh, three medications given, they saw the need, three milligram tablet, given around 0700 hours, signed. Then anti uh, prophylactic antibiotics, Zinoset 1.5 gram IV and gentamicin 80 mg IV to be given here in our Then two units of PAC RBC available in that pack. The other four years also present, CDC and single cell test. Then marking of surgical site done by Dr. Maher. The patient will yell, bowel is open, then uh, the insurance on the other side of the room. That's it. Right, the same statement. So, thank you, guys. 7.15. All scrub team will wash hands with Povidon IV scrub or chlorhexidine with alcohol or the scrub stat prior to performing surgical procedures. The initial scrub includes a small brush which is used around the nail area only then discarded after single use. In surgical scrubbing, the hands and arms are rinsed under running water. Antiseptic agent is squeezed into palm of the hand and hands and arms are washed to the elbow for two minutes. Five minutes scrubs are required for pre-operative hand washing. The lather is rinsed off with running water. The fingers and fingernails are scrubbed with a sterile brush for one minute. The hands are rinsed. The procedure for washing the hands and arms for two minutes is repeated. Following the rinse, the head and arms are elevated away from the body. Good morning. Let's do the sign-in, please. Mr. Ali Hussein Al-Hassan. I'm Sister Rafali. I'm the circulating nurse of this room. We will take care of you until the surgery is ended. I am Dr. Mohsen. I am your anesthesiologist. I am Dr. Mohsen. I am Dr. Rahman Jamal, who is our orthopedic surgeon. I am Dr. Fadi Abdul Zidan. I am Dr. Lee Yorish Gardner. I am Dr. Lee Yorish Gardner, sir. I am Chris Yorish Sensitive Fingers. Our patient is Mr. Ali Hussein Al-Hassan. Medical record number 120438. Correct. This patient is for total knee arthroplasty on the right knee. Marking is here. Consent signed by the patient. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. And patient is in the fine position. Mr. Lim, are your anesthesia machine and product monitor and medications completed? Yes, completed. Doctors, the patient has no known allergy. Dr. Mose. Is there difficulty in intubation or aspiration risk? 
for thorough assessment, I don't expect any aspiration or difficult intubation risk. Dr. Adnan, is the risk of blood loss? Yes, approximately 500 to get And there are available to you that you have Everything is clear. Sign-in time is 0900 hours. Thank you very much and we can, you can do the induction now. Sir, our 
Hello, uh, I'm coming from, uh, this is my surgical wife. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm coming from the laboratory. Uh, I want to relate the panic results of Ali Hussein and Hassan, file number 120438. I'm just going to see panic results. Okay. Patient's name, Ali Hussein Al-Hassan, file number 120438. Yes. Hemoglobin is 5.8 grams per ml. Hemoglobin is 5.8 grams per deciliters. What is this? I am trial. 1 double 8 double 4. Okay. This is Grace uh, 5654, much number. Can you read that? Patient is Ali Hussein Al Hassan, file number 120038. Panic result is hemoglobin 5.8 grams per deciliters, relayed by Mam Grace, version number 5654. Okay. What's the time on Grace? Five Seventeen fifteen. Okay. Perfect timing, Doctor. I will say that hazard semoglobin drop to 5.8 grams per deciliters. That's why it looks well. Okay, I will order a cross margin of two minutes of blood at this Okay, then. مرحبا بكم 
you can uh, hear my voice? Yes, we can. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Sami. Ahlan. Uh, I hope that the video is, is uh, يعني, the streaming was okay. I am not sure if it's, it was okay or not. Uh, next time, يعني, if we have this course, uh, we will uh, uh, maybe view it directly from, from, from the computer uh, in the training center because of the streaming. So uh, if uh, the sound was not clear or the picture was not clear, I'm sorry for that. Uh, it's a technical problem. Anyhow, uh, I hope also it gives uh, some idea. Yes, uh, it is. It was in a, a hospital setup, but also we have uh, uh, opportunities for uh, and risks uh, in, in the uh, ambulatory center, and we have to uh, uh, also take into consideration all the safety goals there. Uh, so. Uh, is there any question anyone would like to uh, uh, put? I know that uh, now is the time for uh, lunch and uh, break. So uh, if you have any question quickly, uh, please ask it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll end up this uh, session and you can go for a break. Um, also, uh, we would like to inform you that uh, we will uh, send you as well uh, like a, a quick te uh, test for, for, for the safety goals, okay? You will do it in the second session, okay? Uh, now you, we can end the, the session uh, and the Atikum al Jamia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.